from the simplest to the rarest of materials. From the barks and fibers of plants to the densest of hardwood. From paper and clay and precious metals to that most wondrous substance, a mind in flight, expressing itself in a torrent of words. These are the materials from which our traditional artisans and craftsmen have built solid and grounded traditions. Fragments of a nation waiting to be made whole by men and women who bring an entire culture and knowledge system into their creations. These are the chosen materials of indigenous craftsmen. They who are the embodiment of Dayao, our knowledge, our pride. In a world where our natural resources are fast running out, wood and stone have become status symbols, materials associated with expensive building projects. But there was a time when wood and stone were plentiful, when they built great structures dedicated to agriculture, exploration, to the community, to noble ideas like nationhood and spirituality. In our continuing series on Materiales Fuertes, the materials that build a nation. We explore how wood and stone were employed by builders and craftsmen from all over the archipelago to build structures and objects that were vessels for the accumulated knowledge of a community. No wooden artifact speaks more of our resilience, our knowledge of the environment, our ability to adjust to nature's changes than a boat. <laughs> our ancestor made and rode on boats that survived perilous journeys across open seas. In Batanes, a land surrounded by rough waters. The skill of a boat builder working in time-tested and traditional ways is still very highly valued. Nag-umpisa ko nang mag-practice ng mag-sarili is noong 1980. Nag-umpisa akong gumawa ng, ano, ng bangka. Ang paggawa ng tataya is ano, para, para sa dagat. Sa mga, ang una namin paggawa kasi para pangisdahan ng dorado. Yan, dorado. Sa ka-flying fish. Kaya namin ginawa yung bangkang ganito kasi nakita namin na mas maganda kaysa dun sa nakita namin na ano, yung may cutting. Nagagumawa kami ng ganitong itsura ng bangka. Kumbaga kasi wala siyang mababali, tsaka balansi siya. Kumbaga sumusun siya ay sumusunod dun sa kung anong type nung, ng dagat, rough, rough kaya o kaya may plain yung, ano, yung dagat, okay siya. E, naglalaro siya, ganun. Kaya yun ang advantahe nung paggawa ng kahoy na flat bottom ang kwan ng bangka. Ito yung kahoy na ginagamit po dito is puro palomaria. Kasi yung palomaria, advantage niyan is hindi siya basta-basta nabibiyak yung kahoy. Meski na naaarawan o ano, hindi siya nabibiyak. Kaya yun ang asa kamatibay. Yun ang, kaya yun ang ginagamit na maraming klaseng kahoy pa na pwedeng gawin. Pero the best is itong palomaria. Parang tingin mo na lang na kung anong gusto mong flat niya, Kung pwede man naman siyang, kasi kung mas flat siya, mas mabagal siya. Kung mas mabi siya, mas mabilis siya. Mas, mas madali siyang tumakbo pag makitid siya. Itong tatayang ginawa namin ito, uh, hindi purpose for fishing na. Educational bangka. Pa, Pag-aralan ng mga estudyante para hindi daw mawala yung... Tradisyon, old tradition ba? Iku.
equal to the Ivatan in their knowledge of boat building are the Sama di Laut of Holo. Their knowledge of boat building and construction was tested in modern times by a man who believed that we have much to learn from indigenous technologies. Art Valdez's journey across Asian waters on a wooden boat built by Sama boat builders is his adventure of a lifetime. So I went to Tawi Tawi and look at how they build the boats and that's how it started. Then I saw that it's still the traditional way of boat building, shell first construction. Uh, if you've noticed the modern boat building is that once the keel is set, they put up the ribs and then the walls or the sidings. But the shell first construction is that you have the keel and then you build planks. Uh, you built a shell of this kind. And then the ribs is the last part. The use of stone in Batanes is not limited to the traditional Ivatan homes. Even the final resting place of the dead, the Ijang, utilize rock and boulders to create distinct boat-shaped graves. On this Ijang, the Ivatan ancestors would journey to the world of the spirits on boats similar to the ones their living kin would sail on. Ang mga boat shape uh, grave markers ay ginawa ng mga ng aming mga ninuno bilang tanda ng kanilang pagkakalibing sa sariling bayan. Kung bakit naging hugis uh, tataya or the local name for the rowboat Dahil ang uh, mga Ivatan, by nature, are sea rowing people. And the uh, Ivatans believe that there is life beyond what they have here on Earth. Na ang, ang pagkaalam nila sa buhay pagka namatay na sila, merong buhay sa kabilang uh, dako kung saan kinakailangan nila na nasa boat sila. They have to row the boat going to where the life after is. The graves vary in sizes because uh, the archaeologists said that the bigger the size is means that the one buried underneath is a grown-up or, or a mature one. But the smaller graves are for the juvenile. And they said that the, the arrangement of the stones says something to do with the social status of the one buried. If it's bigger, he could have been one who is uh, who has a higher position in the society, say the Mangpus or the chieftain. They said that it is close to the sea and it is in an elevated place. A lot of these uh, graveyards are located in elevated places. So maybe because they they see the importance of uh, this dead person having life after death. They bury the dead in high places, which is overlooking the sea, because uh, they see the importance of the connection of the land to the sea, to the life after death, where they are, where they are heading to. We do not know how long have they been buried here, but the, the archaeologists uh, studied that they had been here before the Spaniards came to Batanes. They say it's prehistoric. The use of stone and a knowledge of masonry enabled the Ifugao to create the great walls of their terraces, ranging from 3 to 20 feet in height, and able to contain both soil and water. No other structure among our indigenous peoples utilizes stone in such a difficult manner, or one that bears such life-giving harvests. Ito yung mga bato na foundation na sabi namin na uh, kopnad. Ito nakaupo sa bato rin. This is rocks. Pero malalaki ito. Katapos sinundan yung medyo maliit. Katapos yung maliit. 
pataas. Walang uh, semento, kundi putik lang ang nag, uh, nag-hold dito sa bato. There are still some Filipinos who think that the lack of pre-Hispanic stone structures like a Borobudur or Angkor Wat points to a lack of development, of vision, of purpose among our pre-colonial people and definitely this is not true. As we have seen, small communities utilized these resources well to create technologies that served their purpose as well. With the Spanish colonization came a new purpose for these resources to build for the glory of the faith, the empire, and the colony. Beside the fantastic, beautifully, and beautifully carved... Uh, Scholar Regalado Trota, or Ricky Jose, has written major works on the evolution and history of Philippine churches. His knowledge serves as our introduction to the traditions of church building, with wood and stone, with faith and force. The first churches and chapels were made of simple materials of wood, bamboo, and thatch. That was the material used and even until the 19th century because we saw pictures. We see pictures of um, simple churches uh, in Mindanao uh, using these materials. And some of them were adopting the Bahay, Bahay Kubo on stilts. When the Spanish started to build, they realized that there were a lot of calamities that visited the Philippines. When they would build of they would be built using stronger materials. Uh, fire was often <clears throat> a danger also. And here in San Agustin also, it, it burned down at least three times before they started to build the stone one. So by 1570s, by the 1580s, they started to think of building in stone. And that was not a, an immediate action. Up to the 19th century, I think even up to the early 20th century, they would have churches of uh, stone and then the pediments or the upper walls of wood or even lighter materials. There was a whole system in uh, gathering the materials. Certain people would go up the mountains to cut wood, lumber. Remember that much of the Philippines was forested before, so they would have to select what kind of wood would be good. And this is the Filipino knowledge of wood. They would know which is the best wood for pillars, which is the best wood for trusses, which is the best wood for walls. So it is a very specific knowledge. Then there were others who did lime, the best lime was from the mountains because it should not, the less salt, the better. Because salt will absorb all the moisture. The lime was different, of different consistencies. No? Some, it uh, differed, it depended on the stone and the kind of stone and the kind of construction and also for the, what is called the palitada, which would protect the stone or the brick from all the erosion of the, the wind. That palitada is a word which Filipinos use from the word paleta to apply the, the line covering. A site familiar and beloved to most Manilenos, a jewel of the faith that has withstood the destruction of Manila in World War II. Ricky Jose took us on a walking tour of the San Agustin Church to understand just how wood and stone were utilized to create this enduring structure. The San Agustin complex is more than just the church and the cloisters that many know. The original structure included both the ruins that now face the bay as well as the adjoining building. Behind me is a very ancient door and above it you can barely see the letters for Calle de San Lorenzo. And uh, it's a, a mystery to us why there is a street name here, but I, I'd like to connect it to a, a very ancient ivory image in the collection here, also of San Lorenzo. So maybe this uh, street name can be related to an ancient devotion to San Lorenzo among the Augustinians. Uh, that has not survived now because this, this street is called Santa Lucia. Um, and having said that, I think this may be one of the oldest, if not the oldest street name in the Philippines. 
From the back of the complex, we now move to the iconic wooden doors. With the larger doors are two smaller ones called Postigo. We're now standing uh, beside the fantastic beautifully and beautifully carved uh, doors of San Agustin Church. Um, stylistically, they are from the Rococo period, uh, which in the Philippines is about uh, from the second half of the 18th century, from the 1750s down to the 1790s. I suspect that they are not original to the early church, of course, because they date you know, later, much later. I, I suspect that when the British came, when they sacked the church, they destroyed the doors. That's why when the British left, they had to make new doors. So these doors could date from about 1764, which that's why they have the Rococo designs. Now, um, notice here the split in the doorway, which is uh, uh, what the Japanese did um, to create a space here. They put sand, they took out this wood, put sandbags, and behind it there were machine guns. So anybody who would cross those streets could be hit by machine gun fire, covered by the sandbags, unsuspecting that the, there was machine guns on here. This, uh, this is one of four Chinese lions. Uh, there are uh, a few others in their other, the other parts of the patio. Um, and it, it stands as a symbol of the Augustinians uh, inculturating of the Chinese elements into the, the Catholic Church. Inside the church, more treasures, as well as clues as to wood and stone were used. We are standing in front of the tomb of Legaspi, the founder of uh, the Spanish city of Manila. Um, his bones were uh, he interred here in some of the chapels in San Agustin, um, but they were upturned when the British in, uh, sacked the church in 1762. In 1945, during the fight between the Japanese and the Americans, a bomb from US, launched from the University of Santo Tomas made a direct hit in this chapel, so everything was damaged. And so uh, after the war, uh, this ch chapel was renovated into the chapel of Legaspi. And the frontal that we saw a while ago came from this chapel. This was originally the San Fausto Chapel. This is the inscription on the bell, Fecit Benitus a Regibus, which means made by Benito de los Reyes. Uh, Benito de los Reyes was one of the most important early 19th century bell casters in Manila. So we, uh, that's, there's a long line of bell casters in the Philippines. We can see here very faintly uh, the inscription 300 and the symbol for a unit of weight, arrobas. Now arroba, one arroba, is equivalent to 25 pounds. So you multiply 300 times 25 and that will be the weight in pounds of this bell. This is the bell that used to hang on the left bell tower of the church. And in the earthquake of 1863, the bell fell, the bell crashed to the ground. 1863 or 1880, the bell crashed to the ground. And uh, it has never moved until recently. And eventually it has moved to this place. The pulpit was installed in 1627. The carving is very similar to some of the frontals on display in the uh, museum and you see the twisted columns but also the, they are the kind that you can insert a finger in between the carvings so very very rare and so that gives us a clue to similar carvings which uh, where you, you can put your finger <laughs> inside then on to the brick dome and the great stone staircase that leads to the second floor of the cloisters leading to the second floor of the monastery and uh, it is distinguished by huge slabs of, what you, of granite called locally Piedrachina. They were imported from China. They were believed at the time to be um, ballast from the ships, but now we know that they were also brought here really to be, to be sold as building stones uh, for paving. And finally, to the Sileria or choir loft, where an enigmatic altar awaits. This is a, an assemblage of these uh, parts from different retablos from the different areas of the monastery and the church. 
Uh, and this was uh, put together in, in the 1960s when most of the church is being uh, restored for the 1965 celebration of Christianization in, in, of the Philippines. So, for example, this frontal of Augustinian saints comes from the San Fausto Retablo, which used to be the left of the uh, main altar. Uh, that uh, that uh, chapel was replaced by the chapel of, of Legaspi. So it was brought up here. And here we can see different Augustinian saints. Here is the Augustinian seal, the heart of St. Augustine pierced by two arrows by the love of God and um, Bishop's mitre, Bishop's hat. And uh, there are three scenes of St. Nicholas of Tolentino, who was one of the major Augustinian saints uh, all over the world, but especially in the Philippines. This is uh, St. Nicholas appealing to a saint, to a soul, um, appealing for help. And this is St. Nicholas uh, in a storm, of, uh, steering a boat to safety. And here is St. Janosagun with the uh, ciborium. And this is uh, Santa Clara de Montefalco with uh, the balance. And this is uh, St. Thomas de Villanueva. So you can see the very Baroque, or what you call um, Solomonic columns, visit columns, uh, put together from Sambra Tablo. These panels are actually placed upside down because the fruit should be, going, should be drooping down and not going up. And um, above there, we, we, there is a symbol which you cannot identify. And then the very topmost, there are two uh, smaller volutes which are more proper for the side of a rotablo and not for the pediment. The lower part of the base is um, 17th or early 18th century. Um, and uh, that part of the pedestal comes from the 19th century, mid 19th century, early late 18th, 19th century and the crucifix stylistically is from the 17th century. This can be considered like an, an icon of the different uh, stages of history of San Agustin. Okay. Inside the choir loft, which is currently being renovated, a wealth of clues as to how the original structure was first built and how wood and stone came together in creating this monument. These details here appear how the woodwork it's fit into the stone and certain gaps here are interesting and also on the other side there are holes for beams I don't know which um, don't necessarily match the beams to hold this floor so the, the, yeah, they were, these talk about these talk about different uh, construction periods The restoration of the Sileria was begun with a grant from the Spanish government and has been continued with the support of Filipino corporations and individuals. Another eminent scholar, Esperanza Bunag Gatbonton, has been in charge of this restoration. She guides a team of young and dedicated artisans and craftsmen, all trained at the Escuela Taller. In the hands of passionate and established scholars like Esperanza Bunagatbonton and Regalado Trota Jose, much the arcane knowledge that built and decorated San Agustin is passed on and made relevant again. But in the hands of these young Filipinos from Escuela Taller, the ravages of time are arrested. The new blends with the old and more generations will yet come to enjoy and take pride in San Agustin. From the stone Indian graves to the terra stone walls of the Cordillera, 
From the wooden boats of the Ivatan to the speedy, sturdy vessels of the Sama, from the great stone churches of the Spanish colonizers to the enduring furniture and carvings, wood and stone have helped shape the most indelible images of communities, of explorers, farmers, and of evangelizers, of builders, all who have helped to shape an evolving image of a nation. We have the structures and the objects, but these are only important as reminders of the minds of their creators. Minds alive with Dayao, our knowledge, our pride.